Good evening, everyone. Welcome to San Antonio. It is so great to see a nice, big audience our first night here. I'm so excited to be speaking with you tonight. I think it's going to be a great, interactive, fun program to kick off this meeting, SABCS 2023. I'm Sarah Hurwitz. I'm a medical oncologist. I'm at the University of Washington Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center. And I am accompanied tonight by my friends and colleagues, Javier Cortez from the International Breast Cancer Center in Barcelona, Spain. Barcelona, <laughs> welcome, <laughs> Javier. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> and Paolo Tarantino from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. Welcome, Paolo. So happy to be here. <laughs> So our goals today are to augment your knowledge of the current and evolving role of HER2-targeted therapies in HER2-positive breast cancer and equip you with skills to optimally integrate HER2-targeted therapies into individualized treatment plans to select and sequence them throughout the HER2-positive breast cancer disease continuum. We have partnered with GRASP and LBC in this program, and so we will be discussing how we can overcome existing challenges and disparities, highlight patient perspectives, and share useful resources for patients. Again, please review and download supplemental resource compendium that's available on the website that has additional educational materials for your patients to help them become better informed and engaged patients in their own care. And now we're going to turn to me. I'm going to kick off the evening by talking about current standards of care and best practices for selection and sequencing of HER2-targeted therapies. Before we get going, I'd like to show this diagram indicating how far we have come since 1998 when the first HER2-targeted uh, therapy, trastuzumab, was FDA approved. In that time, we have seen the approval of eight, at my last count, HER2-targeted therapies, including three HER2-targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitors, two antibody drug conjugates that are HER2-targeted, and three monoclonal antibodies. And as you can see here, there are a number of other therapies that have been in development or are currently in development. And this has led to significant improvements in outcomes for patients diagnosed with this disease that used to have a very poor prognosis associated with it. Let's talk about how we treat HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer. And as of today, in 2023, first-line therapy for metastatic breast cancer that's HER2-positive is still the THP regimen, and that is based on the findings of the Cleopatra study, which demonstrated that adding pertuzumab to trastuzumab and taxane not only significantly improved the progression-free survival for patients, but also the overall survival. It's notable that the median overall survival in that setting was nearly five years. These were truly historical chain, uh, data at the time of presentation. But keep an eye on that median PFS of 18.7 months because I think it'll be soon that we're going to see that needle move um, into a further direction um, with the reporting results um, soon, I imagine. In second-line setting, after trastuzumab and ataxane, our new standard of care is trastuzumab, trastuzumab deruxtecan, a HER2-targeted antibody drug conjugate, which is the second one approved for HER2-positive breast cancer, the first being trastuzumab emtansine on the right side there. Trastuzumab deruxtecan has a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor payload. It has a high drug to antibody ratio. It has a tumor selectable, selective cleavable linker and a bystander effect because once that payload is released in the HER2 positive breast cancer uh, cell, it is membrane permeable and can kill neighboring cells that have lower expression of HER2. 
The Destiny Breast 03 clinical trial, uh, which was co-led by my um, colleague here, Dr. Cortez, um, was truly practice changing. In this study, TDXD was compared to the then standard TDM1 uh, in patients who'd received trastuzumab and ataxane in the advanced setting. This study um, uh, had a primary endpoint of progression-free survival by blinded independent central review. And as you can see, both progression-free and overall survival were statistically significantly improved with the use of TDXD compared to TDM1. And just take a look at the median PFS at the, uh, this reporting. In the second line setting and beyond, the median PFS was 28.8 months, which is 10 months longer than reported in the Cleopatra study in the first line setting, where 90% of patients enrolled were trastuzumab naive. So these, again, are historic data and I think indicate that the field is moving um, toward even and better outcomes for our patients. And just showing you how those, those data in the second line setting and beyond, far right, 28.8 months, compared to all other uh, reported data at that time in the second line setting and beyond. The Destiny Breast 09 study is a study that is currently ongoing and enrolling in the first line setting, comparing TDXD to TDXD plus pertuzumab to the Cleopatra THP regimen. I don't think it takes um, a gambler to um, put the bet on um, TDXD winning this, just given what we've seen in the second line setting. That said, I'm not certain that's going to be the right regimen if TDXD does win for every patient. We know our patients can be maintained on HP for many years a lot of times, which is really well tolerated. So I think we're going to have a lot of work to do once these results report out in selecting patients and determining whether we can do an induction with TDXD and an easier maintenance strategy later. The most common adverse events associated with TDXD are shown here. Um, the anemia experienced by patients um, occurs about a third of the patients, and you can see some other cytopenias, but the thing patients are aware of most is nausea. Over three quarters of patients will experience nausea and or vomiting, so we have to be very proactive in our management of this to improve their outcomes and this is, uh, or their experience, and this is associated with a weight drop in about a quarter of patients. Pneumonitis is also an adverse event uh, of special interest associated with TDXD. In this trial, there were no grade four or five events, but 15% of patients experience this. This can be life-threatening. In other studies, patients have died, and so underscoring the importance of picking it up and managing it quickly is really important. Um, Paolo, I think, uh, uh, provided this nice slide for us, the five S rules, screen patients, scan them, synergy, uh, suspend treatment, and steroids. So it's important for us to select patients carefully, to ask them at each of their visits if they're having any shortness of breath or fever or cough, scan them regularly when they develop or if they develop any symptomatic ILD, immediately stop um, and start steroids. And if asymptomatic ILD seen only on scan, you should stop therapy and uh, consider steroids and utilize the involvement of your pulmonology colleagues. In the third line setting, uh, this too is getting more interesting. So this is, um, most of the studies were done after TDM1. And the first one I'm going to show you is the Destiny Breast 01, the single arm study that actually led to um, an accelerated approval of TDXD um, in 184 patients. You can see the objective response rate of 61% and progression-free survival of 16.4 months in patients who'd had a median of five prior lines of therapy were really impressive results and um, were quickly practiced changing. These data were validated in the randomized uh, Destiny Breast 02 Phase 3 clinical trial, showing on the left the significant improvement in progression-free survival, and on the right lower quadrant the uh, significant improvement in overall survival with TDXD compared to treatment of physician's choice, again, making this
this a standard in patients who'd already received TDM1? We have a variety of tyrosine kinase inhibitors available as well. The first available is lipatinib, followed by neratinib, and more recently, the HER2 selective tucatinib. Going through the more recent data relating to neratinib um, with capecitabine compared to lipatinib capecitabine from the NALA study, neratinib was associated with a two-month improvement in mean progression-free survival, but no significant difference in overall survival. Diarrhea is a um, significant concern with neratinib, so needs to be managed proactively, utilizing dose escalation of the neratinib and upfront prophylaxis with antidiarrheal agents. Um, more recently, we've seen data from the HER2 CLIMB trial looking at the addition of 2-catinib, a HER2-selective tyrosine kinase inhibitor to mitigate the diarrhea associated with off-target EGFR inhibition. Tucatinib was added to trastuzumab capecitabine and compared to placebo tras capecitabine. In this uniquely designed study, nearly half of the patients had brain mets at the time of enrollment. This was due to the fact that tucatinib is known to cross the blood-brain barrier and had early evidence of intracranial responses. This uh, really changed our thinking about how to design clinical trials in patients who have, uh, allowing patients on who have even active brain metastasis. And the results were, uh, again, practice changing. Tucatinib added to uh, CAPE and TRAS not only improved progression-free survival, but also significantly improved overall survival. And as we'll hear about in our next talk, also improved outcomes for our patients who have brain metastases. Now, tomorrow morning, you will see the data from this study. The HER2-CLIMB-02 clinical trial was a study designed to look at tucatinib plus uh, TDM1 in patients who'd received uh, trastuzumab plus um, uh, ataxane in a prior setting. This phase three clinical trial was a one-to-one -one randomization. Um, there was a press release that the data were positive, so please uh, join at the general session tomorrow to hear more. So now, after going through all of this data, I want you all to put your thinking caps on and get your iPads ready, and colleagues stand ready because I'm gonna ask you some questions too. Let's go over a case and apply some of these data. So we have a 62-year-old black woman who presented to clinic for newly diagnosed metastatic breast cancer. She has no social support system, she lives alone, and she has difficulty with transportation. Uh, she is also unemployed, so a lot of um, social, social de determinants of health potentially at work here. Originally, she was diagnosed with a 1.3 centimeter node negative invasive breast cancer that was triple positive four years ago. She had surgery. She didn't receive any radiation or systemic therapy. She was lost to follow up. She developed more recently abdominal fullness, right upper quadrant pain, and significant fatigue, went to the emergency room, and was found to have an 18 centimeter liver with multiple solid metastases. Her liver enzymes were mildly elevated, but the function, the coags, albumin were normal. A biopsy demonstrated metastatic breast cancer, again, high grade and triple positive. And so I wanna to turn to my panelists and ask you, Javier, what do you think about that treatment recommendation of THP? And, and maybe is, are there patients in whom you select to use endocrine therapy with, with HP as opposed to chemo HP? So thanks, Sarah. I think that's, um, that, that, that's a good question. Maybe not for this patient who has, I wouldn't say a visceral crisis, but the liver is clearly involved. So for me, clearly for a chemo indication, plus, plus, trastuzumab, pertuzumab. But see, this patient had social problems. So what worries me the most if is she will be able to continue coming to the hospital. That's maybe one of the reasons for some folks decided to go for maybe endocrine therapy in this case, just to avoid alopecia, because maybe for these social problems, the patient might be discontinued and coming to the hospital. But if this patient does not have a good response, she may have important problems. So even though she might not continue coming to the hospital, I would encourage her to, to, to receive chemotherapy plus. If not such an 
important involvement in the liver, although I prefer chemotherapy plus trust to plus PER2, maybe because of this specific situation, maybe I would give her endocrine therapy plus trust to map plus PER2 map. But again, in general, I would go for chemo plus plus. Yeah, it's so important to engage with patients and see what their, what their own social circumstances, economic circumstances will allow for. Um, Paolo, how would you look at this case? Are you thinking you're going to try and convince to do chemo? Are you thinking more endocrine therapy with HP? And have you ever used a subcutaneous form of HP? This might be an option that would be helpful for this particular patient. So I totally agree with Javi that in this case, I would feel compelled to use chemotherapy and discuss it at least with the patient if she feels like she expects to be compliant with it. One thing that I think is important here is, first of all, the high response rate observed in Cleopatra. About 80% of the patients have a response with this regimen, so we really expect it to, to, to help in this situation. And then we know that we can use different taxanes. We had the Peru's trial that compared paclitaxel to docetaxel, not paclitaxel. They were equally effective. And in this case, if the patient had problems at coming every week to do paclitaxel, we may think of using docetaxel every three weeks. That was the originally taxane utilized in Cleopatra. And, and apart from that, of course, the, the availability of an easier formulation for um, and trastuzumab and pertuzumab subcutaneous, FESGO, I think it's great in this situation, would help a lot. And there's also uh, strategies that are being studied to prescribe it and to, um, uh, to inject it at home for the patients. There are CEF injectors that are being discussed. So I do think that in the future, subcutaneous injection, and also right now in the present, is, is, making, is helping a lot in these kind of situations. But definitely I would do my best to convince the patient to, to utilize chemo offering endocrine treatment as an alternative in case chemo was not preferred. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Javier, when you're talking to a patient like this, she obviously was lost to follow up. She must be terrified when she comes in and she's, she now knows her liver is full of metastases. It's very frightening. And many patients will say, how long do I have to live? And that's a question no, no oncologist should ever tell an individual patient. But you do have sort of a responsibility to talk about the data. What do you think about that? How, how would you answer that? What do you think the overall survival is for our patients now diagnosed today? Yeah, no, that, that, that's a great <laughs> question because we are talking about the data we had with the Cleopatra with the five years median follow-up. But it's true that now with TDXD coming into the road to cut and other drugs, I think that this is much, much longer. But uh, when a patient is asking you, how much time will I live? Okay, so only God knows that. But there are two ways of answering the question. And I think that life is always like a glass of water. It's not full of water, it is not empty of water. And there are oncologists that we like to see always the part of the glass with the water. And other ones are always looking at the empty part of the glass. So I think that being optimistic, but realistic, is also important. So I would answer to this patient that, although we do not know how much time, our, our, our task is for our patients to die with cancer and not because of the cancer. So, and this in the her 2 positive field is more and more frequent. God, thanks. When you look at the Cleopatra and the Perus longer follow-up, there are 14 percent of patients free of progression after 10 years. So I think that if there are some patients that might be cured, is there the group of patients with her to positive metastatic breast cancer? So I think that I would say, listen, let's start with the treatment, which is very, very effective, mm -hmm. and let's see how things are going. But maybe you will be able to, to die by other consequences, not because of the disease. That's how I would approach this patient. Absolutely. Now, Paolo, we haven't yet talked about brain metastases, but in a situation like this, it's not terribly uncommon untreated HER2-positive breast cancer for the patient to have uh, synchronous brain metastases at the time of their diagnosis. Would that change your recommendation of what you give in the frontline setting? 
That's a tricky situation, because in this case, a, to a single brain metastasis is not expected immediately to threaten the life of the patient, whereas the liver involvement, to me, is more scary. So I would start a systemic treatment first, but then plan to treat local regionally the, the metastasis, either with surgery or radiation treatment. And these are really the cases where multidisciplinary man management can make the difference, discussing it with radiotherapists, with surgeons, neurosurgeons, and, and radiologists, and all the care team, I think it's really critical to understand understand what is the best way to approach that metastasis. And more and more, we are realizing that in certain cases, we can delay local regional treatment. So in this case, it is complex because the systemic disease is impacting more on the life expectancy of the patient. So I would start systemic treatment, but definitely think about local regional management. And for a two centimeter metastasis, in general, radiation treatment works pretty well. So she did con connect with a local cancer support community and initiates therapy with THP. After two cycles, she's much improved. She's able to walk her dog twice daily again. After four cycles, she has a 70% reduction in her tumor burden. And after six cycles, a complete response in the liver. Um, she is developing moderate neuropathy and edema related to the docetaxel and drops the taxane but continues the HP and initiates an aromatase inhibitor concurrently with the HP. 20 months later, she has progression in the liver with a new one centimeter lung metastasis. So I just want to check with my colleagues and make sure you agree with this. And I just want to be a little bit controversial. She had a massive response with the taxane and HP. So if she had resolved neuropathy, no more edema, is there a patient that you'd consider going back to docetaxel, trying to reinduce a response and then maintain on HP? Or are you saying it hasn't worked going on to TDXD? Javier. So that's a very good question. She had a great, great response, but I don't know if this great response was to chemo or to the double blockade plus chemo. I think that the double blockade here plays the major role. So I, I wouldn't go back to chemotherapy, I think that with the data we have, even if we would not have TDXD, I would jump into TDM1 much better than coming back to chemotherapy. In my opinion, allowing everything, I think that, in my opinion at least, I would go for an antibody that conjugate, in this case, TDXD with the data we have, with a 28 plus medium PFS, it's difficult to imagine other, other better option. Right. Paula, do you agree? Totally agree. I think uh, reinducing with chemotherapy is an appealing option, but with not enough data in support. And so in this case, I would definitely prefer a data-driven approach with TDXD. Talking about data-driven, do you do a brain scan at this point when you're <laughs> selecting your second-line therapy? <laughs> Touché. <laughs> That's definitely one of the settings where we don't have enough data to guide our actions, but knowing that about 30 to 50% of patients with early positive breast cancer end up having brain metastasis. I definitely believe that screening the brain, even if the patient did not have brain metastasis before, can help selecting treatment. Not in this case, because I do feel that even for patients with brain meds, TDXD is the best second line, but in general, it can help to pick them when they're smaller and more approachable with local treatment. So, so yes, in that case, I tend to differ a little, a little from the guidelines. And, and what about you, Javier? It's controversial. Yeah, no, I think Paolo made great, great comments. I think that we are still working based on the past. And with the great data we have now in the brain with tucatinib, with TDXD, I don't know if we, should, if we should change or not the way we proceed. But in the clinical practice, to be very honest, I wouldn't do a brain imaging before changing my treatment, only if we have some symptoms. Okay, okay. And... The last question I want to know is how frequently you are each doing imaging to detect ILD with TDXD. Javier, you first. <laughs> so, uh, so, <laughs> so if the question is how often should we do it, my answer is we don't do, we don't know. If the question is how often do I do it, I do every three cycles for the first a year and every 12 weeks thereafter. That's what I do. Okay. So, but what worries me more is what will happen if TDXD moves into the early breast cancer setting. Do we have to do a CT scan 
every whatever in the advanced city or not, that's something still a matter of debate. But in the metastatic setting, this is what I do. Paolo, what about you? 100% agree. For the average patient, I utilize every three cycles. I would say that depending on the patient I have in front of me, I may think of a more strict approach. If the patient is frail with lung comorbidities, I may think of doing it even after two cycles, every six weeks. That is what was done in the clinical trials. But doing that for all the patients, I don't think it's pragmatic and feasible. So every nine weeks is definitely uh, acceptable. Every 12 weeks, I think, is the limit. Going beyond that can become a risk. Excellent, excellent. Okay. All right. Um, I just want to mention we got a ton of questions coming in. I, I am seeing them here. We're going to talk uh, at the end of the program and try and answer as many as possible. So keep them coming. And now it's my pleasure to pass the mic over to Dr. Cortez. Thank you very much, Sarah. I will stand up because I'm getting old and I don't <laughs> see from this distance. So I, I have to be here because if not, I, will not I, don't, I don't know what I'm going to say. So thank you very much, Sarah, Paolo for giving me the opportunity to be with you today, and thanks very much for being with us. As you can see here, I, was, I always say the same. The, uh, my English is the best here, so you can learn oncology. I know the same as you, but you can learn also English, which is, which is great together. I, I love this. So brain metastasis is always a challenge. So we do not know how to treat patients with brain metastasis because we have just a few prospective clinical trials. And I think that common sense is also very important. When we, do, or when we have clinical trials, this helps us to guide our decisions. But the clinical practice is much more difficult to enroll in patients in clinical trials. But our patient will be there. So I will give you some thoughts, some inputs, that maybe will help you to treat your patients in the clinic. So let me stand, start from the very beginning about the incidence of brain metastasis for patients with her 2 positive disease. So when you look at the statistics, it is in the range of 20 to 50% of patients with metastatic her 2 positive breast cancer will develop at some time brain metastasis. So breast cancer is clearly one of the most frequent reasons for patients to develop brain metastasis. Lung cancer maybe is the first one. Melanoma is very frequent in terms of the incidence, but because melanoma is lower than breast cancer, at the end, we have more patients with brain metastasis from melanoma, sorry, from breast cancer than from melanoma. And there are different options to treat brain metastasis depending on different factors. So we have local therapies, and here we have two different approaches. We have surgery that usually is not very frequently used. I don't know in your experience if you go for surgery very, very often. Maybe when we have a very important mass effect, when we need a pathology, I, I think that I do not go for surgery many times, but this is what the evidence says. And of course, we would need a limited number of lesions and no extracranial or very well controlled extracranial disease. And we also have radiation therapy and or radiosurgery. Two comments about this. The first one, is that we have changed the way we see radio, uh, 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 radio surgery. So we started from up to three lesions, and now there are people that say maybe up to 10. The other day I had a, a, a patient who came to me for a second opinion, and she received radiation therapy, radio surgery, for 30 lesions at that time. So I don't know if they thought that the liver was the brain. I don't know, but 30 lesions was treated with radio surgery. I don't know if it was well done or not, but it was well done. For, for sure, up to 10 lesions, I think is quite reasonable. And sometimes there are some combination strategies with surgery and radiation and radiation, radiation therapy, radio surgery. What is very clear is that usually, if we can avoid ball, ball, whole, whole brain irradiation, try to do it because this might have an impact in quality of life. Clearly, we have changed the way we see brain metastasis because we have started to have very interesting drugs. We have the tucatinib and other TKI, inhibit TKI inhibitors, and also we have the new antibody drug conjugates. So the question is, how should we approach patients with the novel brain metastasis. 
Should we go for up from local therapies or we should go for up from systemic therapy? The answer is unknown. We do not have prospective clinical trials to answer this specific question. So I think that it will depend on sin symptoms, it will depend on the extracranial disease, it will depend maybe on the age of the patient. So there are many features that might have an impact in our decision. Let's start from the, I would say, from the very beginning. Let's start for the one of the most important clinical trials in the past, the Cleopatra. So in the Cleopatra, there were a very few patients with stable brain metastasis at baseline. It was first line. However, when we look at the number of patients who develop brain metastasis as progressive disease, we observe two things. The first one, the total number of patients with new brain metastasis were identical in the placebo compared with the uh, uh, pertuzumab arm, but pertuzumab increased the time to develop brain metastasis. Does it mean that pertuzumab prevent brain metastasis? Clearly not. Remember the Geyer paper, the Geyer study, the capecitabin plus lapatinib or capecitabin plus placebo. We observed a less number of brain metastasis in the lapatinib uh, arm, and we expected, we said, well, maybe lapatinib is preventing brain metastasis. And the MEA and the FDA said, you have to prove that run the cerebral study, remember the cerebral study, chemo lapatinib, chemo trastuzumab. Patients without brain metastasis at baseline. Results, identical number of patients develop brain metastasis. So lapatinib did not prevent brain metastasis, but the more time you have the disease control, the more time you will need to develop brain metastasis, lung metastasis, liver metastasis, etc. So this is breast zero three. So we will make some comments afterwards with the Sarah's presentation uh, at ESMO. But in this trial, patients basically with stable and treated based uh, uh, brain metastasis were allowed. I will make a comment in a minute about unstable brain metastasis. Remember the data that Sarah presented, amazingly improvement in, in PFS and survival. But when we looked at those patients with and without brain metastasis, two comments. The first one, prognosis was worst if we had brain metastasis, but the benefit of TDXD over TD1 was identical. So if we have patients with or without brain metastasis, TDXD is clearly superior compared with TDM1. Here you have the overall response rate into the brain, and you can see here that TDM1 was clearly inferior compared, compared with TDXD. 64% of response rate in the brain compared with 33%. So Sara presented at ESMO something very interesting. We did a pool analysis, destiny breast 01, 02, and 03. Destiny breast 01, in the late line, only treated and stable brain metastasis were allowed. But in Destiny Breast 02 and Destiny Breast 03, at the very beginning of the, tri of the trial, patients with unstable brain metastasis were included. We had an amendment, and we did not allow to include more patients with unstable brain metastasis after. So that's why patients with unstable brain metastasis in these two trials were just a few. But look at the data. When we look at the overall response rate in patients with stable or patients with unstable brain metastasis, overall response rate with TDXD in the range of 45%. With physician's choice in the range of 10 to 20%. So clearly TDXD had activity in patients with stable brain meds and in patients with unstable brain meds. Again, small number of patients with unstable brain meds, only 40 four patient, patients in both studies. When we looked at the progression-free survival in this pool analysis, the concept here, we cannot say, well, it seems 
that the benefit of TDXD is superior in untreated compared with treated brain metastasis. No, forget, this data comes from different trials here, so it's very difficult to compare. So the key message is that in both groups of patients, TDXD behaves better than the control arm. Now, do we have any specific prospective clinical trials for patients with unstable brain metastasis? Unstable brain metastasis means or de novo brain metastasis, non-treated, or progressive brain metastasis after local treatment, whatever the local treatment was. And here we have the tuxedo, 15 patients, 1-5, no 5-0, 1-5. 73% of the response rate is 15%. Look at the confidence interval from 48 to 90%. But the main message here is TDXD works in the brain. An amazing median progression of free survival in the range of 14 months for patients with unstable brain metastasis. So a clear signal of activity. Second, DEBRA. DEBRA is a different cohort study. So it doesn't matter the reason why we included cohort one. At that time, we didn't have any data of TDSD in patients with brain metastasis. So we were recommended to include a cohort with stable brain metastasis, cohort one. Cohort two, and so the novo brain metastasis, HER2 low and HER2 positive. Cohort three, progressing brain metastasis, HER2 positive. Cohort four, progressing brain metastasis, HER2 low. And cohort five, we will present the data of cohort five at San Antonio this year. It is a spotlight session for patients with meningeal carcinomatosis but all these seven patients did have a positivity in the, how do you say CSF? Or CS, well, the, the, yeah. the here. Positivity CSF. in the liquid. So <laughs> all of these patients did have real carcinomatosis. Amazing data. This is the first time we conduct a trial, and for all patients, we require confirmation by a pathologist. So it is not just imaging-based, it's pathology-based, okay? So results for the HER2 positive cohort. So here you have the results. So in the intracranial uh, activity, 44 to 50% of our response rate, identical to destiny breast 0, 2, and 3. Remember, 45. In the total, Cohort, so intracranial and extracranial in the range of 60 to in the range of 60, 62 percent. Rosette. Rosette was a multicenter retrospective, so like real world evidence data conducted in Japan, if I am if I am right. So 60, 51 patients in total, overall response rate in the range of 60 to 70 percent. So we took we will take everything together, all this data, looking at Destiny Breast 03, Tuxedo, Rosette, Debra, and also the American real world evidence experience. You can see here the overall response rate. We did an exercise. We considered the overall response rate and the total number of patients included in all these studies. Do you know which was the overall response rate? 62%. Do you remember the overall response rate in Destiny Brazil 01? 62%. So which is the key message, in my opinion? The overall response we had in the brain is very similar or identical to the overall response rate we had outside the brain. So once again, the benefit is similar, the prognosis is worse. Now, let's jump into the hair to climb. Hair to climb is one of the most elegant, in my opinion, clinical trial designs. And I don't know if I am wrong, correct me if I am wrong, but I think this is the first time for a large randomized study, patients with unstable brain metastasis were included. 
Congratulations for the pharma and for the team. Very well done. So I think that for the future, we should include patients with and without brain metastasis. Just stratify, but don't exclude these patients for clinical trials. So Sarah presented the key results of this study. To Tucatinib improved progression and overall survivals for this group of patients. But here we have the amazing data in patients with active or unstable brain metastasis. So to catinib plus plus compared with placebo plus plus, trastuzumab and CAPE, did have much better outcomes. So beautiful data, overall response rate with to catinib 44%, 47% in this patient population. So we have other combos, other strategies for patients with brain metastasis, but here you have broadly the overall response rate. In my opinion, it is difficult today to justify the use of neratinib or the use of lapatinib when we have data with tucatinib, which improves everything also in patients with brain metastasis. So for me, tucatinib is the optimal TKI, TDSD is the optimal antibody drug conjugate, and maybe the optimal drug for the whole group of HER2 positive. NBC. Let's review quickly the ESMO guidelines, which I think are quite reasonable for patients with unknown, with no or with treated brain metastasis. Clearly, TDXD is the second line standard of care, no doubt. For patients with unstable brain metastasis, we have different situations here. And this is, in my opinion, Something that we can have a, an important debate. Should we go for local intervention if available? For example, we have three brain meds or four. Is it better to go for radio surgery at the very beginning or not? I don't know. These are the guidelines. The guidelines say that we should go for local intervention, intervention if we can do it. And if not, maybe to cut in it is the preferred option according to the guidelines or TDSD. Again, this is something a matter of debate. Some of us will prefer TDSD. Some of us will prefer tucatinib. Both of them are very good drugs. If you say to me, well, we have data, randomized data for tucatinib, and we, will not, we do not have randomized data for TDSD, I will answer with a question for you. Which randomized data do you have for a patient who did not receive TDM1? Remember, in the HER2 climb, all patients receive TDM1. So after Cleopatra, if you have unstable brain metastasis, we do not have randomized data for tucatinib nor for TDSD. So both strategies, in my opinion, are very good. So oligoprogressive disease in the brain. So what does oligoprogressive disease in the brain mean? In, or means, means. In Spanish, significa. <laughs> so it means that you have a good response uh, with any treatment, and you have disease progression that occurs with a limited number of sites, in this case, only in the brain. So as I said before, which is the best approach here? Do we have to go for a local treatment? Do we have to change the systemic therapy? Do we have to combine both? Again, if we do not have enough data in the broad population for the oligoprogressive disease, it's even worse. So what I would recommend, and that's my absolutely personal opinion, if I have oligoprogressive disease in the brain, I would treat it locally, and maybe I would continue with the same strategy as before. But now imagine that you have a Cleopatra, and you have amazing data with tucatinib or with TDSD. Should we continue with Cleopatra, or should we jump into TDSD or tucatinib? I don't know. <laughs> Always discuss with a, 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 a MCT, with multidisciplinary team, MDT, and there are some aspects that may favor the a, a, a local strategy and some 
aspects that might favor the systemic therapies. Again, in my opinion, it's case by case, patient by patient. So I do not have any specific comments to be said. You have here some thoughts. Again, it depends. I don't know if this is good enough or not. I think that this is something that I would always recommend to discuss patient by patient. In general, for HER2 positive disease, I would think about systemic therapies. For non HER2 positive disease, I would consider always local therapies. But again, it depends on many other aspects as well. So in conclusion, I think that brain metastases are unfortunately very frequent. If we have brain metastases to have HER2 positive disease, it's good news because prognosis is much better compared with HER2 negative disease. What to say about triple negative disease? It's awful, unfortunately. So TDXD and to cut in it data are very good in patients with or without brain metastasis. But in my opinion, I would like to finish with two comments. The first one, we should include patients with unstable brain metastasis in randomized clinical trials as well. And second, oligoprogressive disease in the brain is not always a bad situation if we treat it accordingly. Finally, you know, sometimes this is an amen need. And I like this nbcbrainmeds.org because this is a way or, or a platform to help patients to interact, to connect with other patients, with, with, with medical advisory boards, to try to tailor the optimal treatments so these patients should not be alone. These patients are there. These patients have a very bad prognosis also from a psychological perspective, so we need more and better drugs. We have to help these patients and we have to include them in clinical trials if, poss if possible. All right, outstanding. I will give you a moment to breathe and sip your water and I'll, I'll ping uh, Paolo for a moment. Um, so we're getting a bunch of good questions in. Um, and so one of them is um, whether or not you have ever used TDXD in concert or near the time that you've given stereotactic radiosurgery. You know, there's case reports of radiation necrosis with TDM1, and do you have any experience? I get asked this a lot. So this is a very important question, and I think a question for which we had very little data up to a few weeks ago, actually. And of course, in the absence of data, I try to avoid doing any type of radiation close to the administration of TDXD. And now this has been reaffirmed with the real-world data presented, uh, published on GEMA Oncology, I think by the MSK team, where they showed that there was a significant increase in the risk of radiation necrosis if uh, TDXD was administered concomitantly or close to radiation treatment. So I do believe that we've got to be careful about this. We need more data, but for the moment, I would try to interrupt TDXD before the radiation at least a few weeks, and then restart it also at least two to three weeks after. Very helpful. Um, Javier, you showed us those beautiful her 2 climb data with Tucatnib. I want to go back with our first case. If a woman is on maintenance HP, has a brain met that's progressing with oligoprogressive disease in the CNS only, would you be tempted to add Tucatnib? Are you ever using Tucatnib in the frontline setting? in this type of situation? So, 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 so for the patient you presented before, Sal, I think that if you have a patient with a baseline brain metastasis, I would go for Cleopatra. That, that today, that's for me, the standard of care in the first line setting. So if we have oligoprogressive disease, and I, I wouldn't be able to add to catnip to trastuzumab, pertuzumab, that's something we cannot do. So I would continue with trastuzumab and pertuzumab after local therapy. But I think that the question is very well taken. So if you are saying to me that if you go for local therapy and you change into tucatinib or into TDSD, you will behave better than continue with trastuzumab and pertuzumab, that's something we do not know. But at the time being, I would continue with, with trastuzumab and pertuzumab. And if I have a second progressive disease, and the time is very short, I will jump into another one. But in the time, sometimes in maybe another year or so, maybe I would continue with radio surgery again. And so, so again, patient by patient is something I would discuss, but from a first view, I would continue with trastuzumab and pertuzumab. 
So I will just add one tiny thing that at Dana Farber we were running a trial to us to answer this question, the Bridget phase two trial led by Sarah Summons that adds to catenib to either HP or TDM1 if the patient has isolate oligoprogressing brain meds. And so we, it's accruing and we hope to have an answer to this question in the future, but currently we don't have it. That's fabulous. So I was just going to ask you, where does TDM1 stand now that we have data supporting THP still is front line, second line TDXD. How are you using TDM1 outside of the Bridget trial? So I think TDM1 is a great drug. It's a very well tolerated and active drug, even in patients with brain metastasis. We have data by Montemuro showing up to 30% response rate, which is not bad in the brain also. Um, in, the, in the data you presented, it, it does work in the brain and also without, in patients without brain metastasis. Of course, with utilizing second-line TDXD, I'm not too compelled to use third-line TDM1 just because we know, and we see in the clinic that HER2 can be down-regulated after treatment with TDXD. We saw it in the DAISY trial. So personally, I prefer to utilize it after something else. I'm, I prefer to utilize a chemo-based strategy like the Tucatinib regimen in third line. But, but I think the data you're going to present tomorrow is going to be also very interesting to understand how to utilize it in the future, the HER2 climb O2 phase 3 trial. Yeah, I think it would be very, very interesting to look at strong real-world evidence data. What about these two drugs, tucatinib-based and TDM1, behaved after TDSD. So unfortunately, we will not have prospective clinical trials there, but real-world real world evidence data might help a lot. But I would agree with Paul. I think that so tucatinib maybe could be the optimal third-line therapy, but in my opinion, the fourth line could be TDM1 again. So I think that both drugs or both strategies have to be used after TDSD. Thank you. And Javier, we had a question about the difference between unstable brain metastases and active brain metastases. And I know there's a number of definitions floating around. It's a moving target. <laughs> are these synonymous in your, in your algorithm? Those are synonymous because they're... Well, yeah. For me, I don't know if I'm right or not, to be very honest. I didn't realize about this change in the terminology. I'm Spanish. I'm not English. So you might answer much better than me. For me, <laughs> active and unstable means that you have a brain lesion that could grow because it has not been treated. So for me, it's or de novo, or patient with progressing brain metastasis after local treatment. For me, these both groups of patients enter into the unstable or active brain metastasis. But again, I don't know if I'm right. No, from active means that also you can treat, and it is active, there are tumors there. So for me, unstable is a better definition than active. But that's my, my opinion, I don't know. The Italian agrees with you. Yes. <laughs> Italy and Spain are for the same. <laughs> Excellent. All right. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna pause on the questions right now in discussion and move to Paolo. So we have a little bit of time after your talk for more questions. So we'll get to these questions. Keep them coming. And sorry. Thank Paolo. you, Sarah. And thank you for everybody for being here tonight at this late hour. Always hard to speak after Sarah and Javier, but I'll do my best. And I'll try to talk about the future, new and emerging approaches with her to target the therapies. Most of the things I'll discuss are not ready for prime time, but some are, or are almost ready for prime time. Let's see. But first, I would like to say that the only way to build the future is through clinical trials, or at least it's the best way we can, we can utilize. And the only way to learn about how to treat patients in clinical trial is to include them and include them irrespective of their characteristics. There was this um, survey that was conducted by Living Beyond Breast Cancer and GRASP together with peer review to understand if especially uh, as your doctor cancer care team ever discussed clinical trial participation in addition to other treatment options with you. And the majority of the participants that were all patients and advocates did never were uh, proposed to be enrolled in a clinical trial. And this is particularly a problem for patients um, from minorities, such as patients uh, that are black. And we know that about 4 to 6% of black patients are included in the trial compared to other um, categories of patients. And this is why there was also another survey that was presented last year at ASCO 2022, showing that patient-led research found that 8 out of 10 black people living with metafibrous cancer would actually consider participating in clinical trials. And so they recommended uh, a few options, a few actions that we can uh, utilize, such as better informed patients, inspire trust, ensure access, and address concerns of the patients in order to improve the enrollment of patients with different characteristics and learn about how these drugs work in patients with different characteristics. 
So what is my recipe for advancement in HER2 targeting in breast oncology and beyond? First of all, new drugs, of course. And we are seeing more and more drugs coming on the horizon. But drugs alone are not enough. We also need biomarkers, prognostic but also predictive biomarkers to understand how to use these drugs. So then smart trials designed in an appropriate way to understand where we need more, when we need less for these patients, and adapt our treatment strategies novel assays. So this is kind of similar to biomarkers, but it's actually meant to understand how to better characterize HER2. And finally, trying to expand beyond breast oncology, trying to learn from breast oncology and take it to other tumor types. Talking about new drugs, I am biased because I work in the ADC field, and I'm very excited about all the news that are coming in the ADC field. And, and I think one big advancement came when we started developing this new generation of ADCs with more chemotherapy, TDM1 at 3.5 molecules of chemotherapy per each antibody. TDXD has got eight molecules. Facituzumab, also another drug that prolongs survival in breast cancer, eight molecules. Some investigational ADCs have up to 12 or 16 molecules, and this is one of the features that makes them more potent. Cleavable linkers that allow this payload to diffuse better, even in heterogeneous tumors, and novel payloads. We, in the past, we used to use mostly microtubule inhibitors as payload. Now we're moving beyond that. And beyond that, we know that ADCs are modular compounds, are like Lego. You can change one part and completely change the activity and safety profile of the ADC. Not always in the, in the good direction. Many ADCs are not as active as, as we would like, but often, yes, often we can make them more active and even better tolerated. You can work on the antibody and make it bispecific, or you can mask it. You can put a molecular mask so it only detaches and is active in a tumor microenvironment and does not attached to normal cells in the body. You can make the linker different, site-specific to improve the stability of the agent, glycoengineered to change the pharmacokinetics, and then, of course, the payload. You can change it. The ways you can change the payload, for instance, are to link two different payloads to the same ADC. There are some preclinical evidences showing that if you inject two different ADCs, one with MMAE and MMAF, two different aristatins, or if you inject one that includes both payloads, the only ADC with both payloads is more effective, is able to introduce in the cancer cell both payloads. And so I think this is an intriguing strategy to do a polychemotherapy in one single agent. And I think this will enter the clinic soon immune-stimulating antibody conjugates, ISACs. There are some already in the clinic in phase one testing that have shown activity in her 2 positive tumors, not only breast cancer, and, and they can deliver toll rack receptor 7 and 8 agonists. And of course, the question is, can this synergize with traditional immunotherapy like PD-1 inhibitors, PD-L1 inhibitors? I think we will see this in the future, but it's intriguing to think that you can deliver anything with antibody drug conjugate. Protax, we're seeing that Protax can help in ear positive disease, but what if you could introduce a protein degrader into the tumor cell? And finally, of course, radioimmunoconjugates. We've been treating cancer with radiation treatment for, for decades, what if we could treat it with a local radiation treatment to ADCs? I think all of these are potential uh, future um, possibilities for ADCs. And finally, try specific antibodies. In general, we are realizing that we can uh, mo modify the antibodies and we can allow them to link together cells that express HER2 with cells that express CD3 and CD28, meaning immune cells. And so bridge the immune cells with tumors that overexpress HER2. We have in interesting data present, uh, published last year on Nature with this uh, tri-specific agent that is in phase one testing now. Beyond novel drugs, we also have many targets. We know that cancer cells express many tar targets on their surfaces, and some on the horizon are HER3, Nectin-4, folate receptors, many of them. One that is intriguing for which we have a little more data is HER3. For HER3, we know that we have an agent, Patritumab de Rusecan, that is a cousin of Trastuzumab de Rusecan. It's got the same payload with the same amount, eight molecules per antibody, but the antibody binds to HER3 instead of HER2. And this was first tested in a phase one trial that included patients with highly pretreated metastatic breast cancer, irrespective of the subtype. 
And there was a subset of patients with HER2 positive breast cancer, HER2 positive, that received this NTR3 ADC, and they achieved the highest response rate, 43% response rate, almost one year of median PFS. I think very intriguing to see this, and there is a phase two trial that is currently enrolling that will show more in this cohort. And then I'm glad to, see, to say that this trial, Satine, a phase two trial of actually Sasituzumab, Govitecan plus Trastuzumab in patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer cancer has just activated, and uh, I work on the development of this trial at Dana-Farber, it will be multicentric, and you know, Sasituzumab so govitica has improved overall survival in hormone receptor positive disease in triple negative breast cancer, but it's never been tested in HER2 positive, and I do believe it's important to test its activity in HER2 positive, and in this small 40 patients phase two trial, we aim to do that. So the second recipe, the second part of the recipe is biomarkers, because I do believe that we cannot use the same drug for, the, for all the patients. We need to adapt our strategies. One intriguing biomarker biomarkers that has been developed and is in advanced phase of development is HER2DX. What is HER2DX? It's a gene signature, basically the oncotype DX of HER2-positive disease that looks at different characteristics, different gene expression signature, tracking immune infiltration that we know how prognostic it is, tumor cell proliferation, proliferation, the aggressiveness of the tumor, luminal differentiation, and uh, the expression of the HER2 amplicon, how HER2 addicted is the tumor, we applied this to a combined cohort of patients with, uh, from APT and ATTEMPT, so patients with small HER2 positive breast cancer, not negative. What we found is that HER2DX was able to find a small population of patients, only 26, that had a higher risk of recurrence, up to 20% risk of recurrence compared to the lower risk population that had much less, only about 3%. So this is retrospective, and there's many retrospective validation of this assay, and, but I do believe that this is being, becoming more and more appealing to, to understand the biology and the aggressiveness of the disease, ctDNA. ctDNA has been tested, has been analyzed in many diseases, not only in breast, cancer and it's showing to, to track the tumors that shed more DNA and that are expected to have a worse prognosis, especially if the DNA shedding persists after treatment. And so there is some data from the iSPY trial that looked at different neoadjuvant treatments for different types of breast cancer. But basically, they showed that if you had ctDNA at baseline that did not obliterate, did not, was not obliterated by the chemotherapy by the end of the neoadjuvant treatment, well, prognosis of the patient was much worse of the patients with no detectable ctDNA or with detectable, detectable ctDNA that became negative after neoadjuvant treatment. So this is also, I believe, very intriguing for the future. What about PET scan? So there was this brilliant trial, the Fergain trial, that was led by Javier here. And actually, it was a phase two trial testing if you could understand with the PET scan those patients that do not require chemotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting. Patients with stage two and three HER2 positive breast cancer. I wish I had the time to go through two, all the data. Unfortunately, I don't. But I think it's very interesting to see that some patients that were responding to neoadjuvant trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and after two cycles of only antibodies were responding on the PET scan, they only continued the antibodies, and more than a third of those patients achieved a pathologic complete response. Very interesting. What about survival? Survival was recently presented at ASCO. At three years, there was only one recurrence out of these 86 patients, and it was a local recurrence. So we need more follow-up, but I think this strategy is appealing to try to identify those patients with very HER2, very sensitive disease to enter to treatment that potentially may be spared chemotherapy. What about trials? I already mentioned some important trials. Some are ongoing. We are, don't yet have data. One is ATTEMPT 2.0. We know that ATTEMPT showed that adjuvant TDM1 for one year is a very effective strategy to prevent recurrence in small HER2-positive tumors, but it adds similar rate of toxicities compared to the traditional APT regimen. What if we only six cycles of TDM1 could be enough? APT, ATTEMPT 2.0 is testing this. And actually, ADEPT, another phase two trial, is testing an even more chemosparing approach in patients that have small stage one HER2 positive or more receptor positive tumor, so triple positive, low clinical risk. Can we avoid any chemotherapy and only give endocrine treatment with um, HP, subcutaneous HP? So HER2 blockade, this is ongoing. 
And then what about um, patients that instead achieve an optimal response at surgery after an abbreviated regimen with THP? We know that there are two trials ongoing, the Compasser, PATCR, and Decrescendo in Europe. They are testing THP in the neoadjuvant setting for stage two and three or two positive breast cancer. And if the patient achieves PATCR, then not doing any more chemo afterwards, only completing her two blockade. And I think this is very appealing for the future. But then we also know that we have patients that unfortunately do not respond as well to neoadjuvant treatment. And so they receive neoadjuvant chemotherapy, trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and they still have residual disease at surgery. And we will see at this Congress actually the final analysis of the Catherine trial that established uh, post-neoadjuvant TDM1 in this setting. But could we do even better than post-neoadjuvant TDM1? The Destiny Breast 05 trial tests TDXD in the post-neoadjuvant setting as a rescue strategy compared to TDM1. And we'll show if we can prevent recurrences even better in this high-risk population. And the Compasser RD trial is also a phase three trial that tests the addition of to catinib to TDM1. I do believe that these strategies are important and, and may potentially allow us to treat patients with high-risk disease even better. And finally, um, Javier and Sarah have already mentioned that several patients, about 15% of the patients in the trial, such as in Cleopatra, with metastatic her 2 positive breast cancer have extremely long-lasting responses, never progress. And we're starting to believe that these patients may, may be actually cured from their metastatic HER2 positive tumor. Can we increase the number of patients cured in the metastatic setting? This is the, the strategy that we're thinking with the SAFO trial that has been now developed at Dana-Farber, thinking of utilizing an adjuvant strategy, even if it's the metastatic setting, for untreated de novo uh, patients with their 2 positive metastatic breast cancer, utilizing 12 weeks of THP, 12 weeks of TDXD, 12 weeks of TDM1 to catenib, the best agents we have, and then only HP to catenib for one year before stopping everything. And of course, it's a proof of concept trial, and it's going to be only about 70 patients included, but I do believe that we have to ask these bold questions to improve outcomes for our patients. And beyond that, beyond de-escalating, escalating, I think we have to test if anterior 2 treatments can have a role beyond HER2 positive. We know that they have a role in HER2 low. TDX is approved for HER2 low breast cancer. What if they could have a role even in ultra low? Destiny Breast 06 is ongoing to test if TDXD is an effective treatment strategy, not only for patients with hormone receptor positive HER2 low, but also ultra low, IHC zero, with minimal HER2 detected by the pathologist. And if the trial is positive, we may move from the past pie chart of only 15% of patients with HER2 positive disease to the current pie chart with an additional 50 or 60% of patients with HER2 low that can receive anterior 2 regimens to an additional pie chart, HER2 ultra low. And finally, with novel HER2 assays, we can move even beyond that, only exclude the very few patients that really have no HER2. And to do that, we need novel HER2 assays. I think some that are very interesting are based on deep learning based image analysis, and one is the quantitative continuous score, for which we have some data. What this uh, algorithm does is basically train on commercial breast cancer sample to detect membrane cytoplasms as nuclei of all tumor cells in the tumor based on immunohistochemical expression over two, and uh, this was blindly applied on the data of TDXD in HER2 low breast cancer, and it was able to dissect a highly responsive population to a population that did not respond. And I think it's interesting that this algorithm looks at what is the pattern of expression of the majority of the cancer cells. There is different from our current guidelines that looked at a minority of cells that express higher too. So I think we have much to learn in terms of assays. And one intriguing aspect may be could we do just a liquid biopsy, a blood draw, non-invasive blood draw, and learn what is the effectiveness of an ADC, for instance? And, and please come tomorrow at the Spotlight discussion two and three. Uh, we're going to show two different blood-based assays. One, to understand if the tumor is HER2 positive, HER2 low, or HER2 zero presented in the morning by Heather Parsons. And in the, in the afternoon, I'm going to present a liquid biopsy instead that looks at the um, signature of HER2 dependence of the tumor. and is statistically associated with the benefit of TDXD. So I wait you all tomorrow. Uh, and apart from that, I think we can learn from all of these points, from all of this recipe, and take it to other diseases. Because we know that HER2 is overexpressed 
is amplified, is mutated, is altered in so many different tumors. We know already that several tumors benefit from HER2 blockade. Gastric cancer benefits from trastuzumab. TDXD also is approved for gastric from lung cancer. But I think we can move beyond that. And one trial that suggests so is destiny pan tumor O2. This, I think, is a striking trial, a phase two trial, a large one, that included 267 patients with different types of cancer, with advanced refractory endometrial, cervical, ovarian, bladder cancer, bilateral tract cancer, pancreatic, salivary, many different types. Basically, an agnostic trial testing in these patients TDXD if there was an IHC expression over two of two plus or three plus. And I think it was very striking to see that both in two plus and three pluses there were responses. They were mostly in the three pluses. And you can see in certain patients with pretreated cervical cancer with HER2 positive three plus, 75% response rate with TDXD. In endometrial cancer, 85% response rate with TDXD. Ovarian cancer, 63%. Barry tract cancer, 56%. Unfortunately, pancreatic did not lead to high responses, but bladder, other tumors, really agnostic treatment. And look down there at the median duration of response for IHC3, 22 months which is similar to what we see in breast cancer, in her 2 positive breast cancer, almost two years of duration of response. So this drug may change the trajectory of disease for patients with many different tumor types over expressing HER2, and it already it had a breakthrough therapy designation for this indication for a pan-tumor approach, and we may be soon using this agent. So my conclusion is that ADCs are modular compounds, and I'm very excited to see everything, every way that we can manipulate the molecule to make it more active and more uh, safe, but it's also important to remember that we need to tailor our treatments, tailor ADCs, TKIs, and every treatment we have with better biomarkers. We need to develop clinical trials to escalate and de-escalate based on the risk of the patient. And finally, I think we need to take what we are learning in breast cancer and expand it to the overall course of patients with HER2-positive breast cancer. Thank you very much. Um, we have a number of questions, I think 37, so we'll get to um, as many as we can. Um, the first question is for you, Paolo, regarding the SATINE study, really interesting trial. Um, and they're asking about whether the use of sasituzumab, which has a similar payload to trastuzumab deruxtecan, may affect the benefit these patients are seeing assuming they have all been previously treated with TDXD, so do you have concerns about that? This is a great question, and one of the challenges with whom we, we let's say, are challenged the most in these days, because we know that we are having more and more ADCs, some of them share a similar payload, topoisomerase 1 inhibitor, and so we really don't know what is the activity of the second ADC. Real-world data are helping us a little bit, and tomorrow there will be four abstracts presented in a spotlight discussion session, so I invite everybody to attend that session. But also I believe that currently, right now, we can suspect that there may be some cross-resistance. The idea is asking, could still be sasituzumab, even with some cross-resistance, be better than traditional chemotherapy? I think it's a question that we need to ask, and we could find both things. We could find that actually it is not so active because the tumor becomes resistant based on the topoisomerase 1 inhibitor, or actually we could find that for some cases it's the target that leads to the resistance. So we don't have much data on this. We have very few publications on few patients. We need to learn more, and I think trials like this will help us to learn more. Excellent, thank you. Um, Javier, we have a question about a patient with leptomeningeal metastases. The patient's received TDXD and has had THP as well, has not yet had radiotherapy, so only leptomeningeal disease, no, no parenchymal. What is the, pa the best option? Now, the caveat is this patient's in the intensive care unit and symptomatic from metastases. So right there, patients in an ICU, Usually we're not treating them with anti-cancer therapies in the breast cancer setting, but, but maybe you can manage that question there. Patients to catnib naive, it sounds like. It so stumped that's, you. That's, <laughs> that's a very bad situation, clearly. So TDSD pretreated, herceptine pertuzumab pretreated. So I would try to catnib clearly, plus, plus. But I wouldn't forget that sometimes radiation therapy might help a little bit to these patients as well. So I, I would 
So depending on the symptomatic the patient is, I would combine both. Maybe I would start with radiation therapy and I would give to catenid plus trastuzumab plus CAPE. But again, I think carcinomatosis is such a terrific situation that whatever you do is, is fine. And, but I would go for tucatinib, definitely. Thank you. Yeah, it's a very difficult situation. I, I agree with that. Um, Paolo, can you talk a little bit more about the manage, management of patients with ILD? Your, your 5S program is great, but you have a patient who's symptomatic. Maybe you can take us through how you manage that. So I think the first thing to remember is to discontinue TDXD. And guidelines suggest that every patient with symptomatic ILD, which means grade two or higher, needs to discontinue TDXD permanently. Because we know that potentially it can escalate to even grade five, to fatal adverse events. So you don't want to reintroduce it if there were symptoms. The challenge is that sometimes the symptoms may be associated with a viral infection or something else. This is why, once again, multidisciplinary um, management, analysis of the scans with the radiologists, it can be very helpful. After discontinuing TDXD for every symptomatic case, there should be introduction of steroids, and the dose depends on the grade. In general, most of the cases are grade two if they're symptomatic, and you would start one milligram per kilogram of prednisone and monitoring carefully the patient. From grade three and grade four, in general, you need hospitalization. So it's a different treatment management, but once again, most of the cases we see are grade one and grade two. We will present among the real world data tomorrow, among 200 patients that received TDXD, 11% developed ILD, and there were no fatal cases. So in the real world, fortunately, we're not seeing so many fatal cases, but in most of the trials of TDXD, there were so. So we need to be extremely careful, discontinue TDXD if a patient becomes symptomatic for ILD, and remember to use Eli steroids, and then slowly taper the steroids in these patients. Yeah, one quick comment here. Even if you have grade one, which is asymptomatic ILD, we have to stop TDXD always and restart after recovery. But it is very important that if you take an ILD in the CT scan, even without any symptoms at all, we have to stop the drug. That's very, very important because if we do, do, if we do not do that, it's very likely that we will go into ILD grade two or higher. So I think this is a very important aspect. We can reintroduce the drug afterwards, but we have to stop at the very beginning. Yeah, it's a really important point, and I'm glad we were able to underscore the management. That's great. Um, Javier, we use biomarkers a lot in ER-positive disease now, ESR1 mutations, PI3 kinase mutations to determine therapy. In HER2-positive breast cancer, it's HER2-positive. Maybe we look at ER, but that's about it. You have a patient, they've had next-gen sequencing done, it's HER2-amplified, and it's got a PIK3CA mutation. Are you using that in your decision making? Well, I'm not. I'm not clearly outside clinical trials. Okay, there are four ongoing clinical trials as a my names after taxane induction therapy. We have uh, the atezolizumab in the PD1 positive population. We have Giredestran in the ER positive population. We have inabolisib in the pic 3 ca patient population. And we have Patina in the hormone receptor positive population. So we have different approaches that maybe in the future we'll have to select more beyond HER2. But today, and outside clinical trials, I think that we will not differentiate the way we treat these patients. Okay, great. Paolo, you presented this beautiful study that is prospectively switching patients. It reminded me of the way that um, you, you start, you do a certain amount of therapy and you switch to another one, you're trying to present, prevent resistance to, to cure the metastatic disease. It's, it reminds me of some uh, like ALL regimens if you stretch back to, to hematology. Um, and I think it's really incredible. But on the other end of that spectrum, looking at whether Destiny Breast 09 beats THP, and now we have TDXD, Will you, would you be um, tempted if you had a patient have a CR in all of the METs with TDXD after, let's say, nine or 12 cycles of therapy, would you ever stop TDXD? Absolutely. I really think that we, we love this way that the Cleopatra treatment regimen was administered because after a few weeks of chemotherapy, that the quality of life rapidly improves and remains very high with only dual blockade. The Destiny Breast 09 trial is designed in with a continuous schedule just because it's the one that we currently use with TDXD in every setting. 
but gladly there is another trial ongoing, the Demeter phase two trial led by Javi that is looking at an induction of TDXT in first line HER2 positive and then stopping TDXT and starting dual blockade. And it's a phase two trial, but I think it will be very informative. And I do believe that since HER2 positive breast cancer is kind of the leukemia of breast cancer, meaning that it's very responsive and it can be potentially cured, I think we need to kind of utilize our treatments in the best possible ways. TDXT is highly potent, but if the patient is not tolerating it extremely well, I think that stopping and starting to blockade is an extreme, extremely appealing strategy. And then I think another important piece will be to see if with reinduction TDXT, there is again a response. And correct me if I'm wrong, the trial is looking at that, right, Carl? No, totally right. Okay. And, and Javier, okay, that's the first line setting, but let's say you have a third line patient who's now had a CR, just beautiful response, but is losing weight, you can't get on top of the nausea, she's saying, look, there's no disease, can I take a break? Are you ever stopping TDXD and maybe going back to a maintenance strategy? Do you have, do you have the, what do they say, cajones? That's a great question. So. Well, if we have to stop, we have to stop. And if the toxicity is important even after decreasing the dose, so quality of life also matters. And we should not forget that we are not treating numbers, which are the results in clinical trials. We are treating patients. And patients mean patients. So I definitely would stop if we have to stop. And what I do in the clinical practice is to continue with trastuzumab single agent. And I would revisit the drug afterwards if needed. So in the second plus line of therapy, I like to continue as much as possible. But if I have to stop, I wouldn't stop without anything, without doing anything, and I would continue with trastuzumab. And in the first line setting, we are running Demeter. But if I would do it by any reason, I would continue with trastuzumab and pertuzumab as a minus. Okay, great. Um, there's a question I'll quickly answer. What about TDXD plus tucatinib for symptomatic brain metastases? So the HER2-CLIMB-04 clinical trial is ongoing, looking at that combination. It's a single arm phase two study. Hopefully we'll have results from that in the next year or two. Um, Paolo, the biomarker work you talked about is very rich. It's very exciting. Um, but it, as I mentioned, HER2-positive disease, we know what the driver is. So talk to us about, in a real-world setting, clinical practice, are you using next-gen sequencing? Are you re-biopsying patients with HER2-positive disease or looking at changes in expression level of the HER2 um, as, as a patient's disease progresses? Absolutely. I think re-biopsying is extremely important. One fundamental moment to do that is upon recurrence, because really you want to characterize what disease you're treating in a metastatic setting. And then one case in which always I try to re-biopsy is if the patient always had HER2-0 disease in the past. Because if there was no HER2 low score in the past, well, you may not use TDXD. But we know that about 30 to 40% of the HER2-0s actually become HER2 low upon rebiopsy. And this is related to temporal heterogeneity, spatial heterogeneity, differences in sensitivity of assays, many different things, but we just know that this is the case. And so before denying the patient the opportunity of getting TDXD, I would do another biopsy in that case. Regarding NGS, it is a little more controversial in to positive breast cancer because we have so many good regimens and drugs that I would like to use those with more data and support before thinking of targeting pic ca or something different. But in late lines, I think it could make sense. Whereas in HER2 negative disease, we know that it's becoming more and more important to utilize NGS, especially with ctDNA. Yes. A, a quick comment. I think that if we do not have clinical trials or we do not have targeted drugs approved, I would be against doing NGS because it can produce, how do you say, anxiety for the patients. So if you have a mutation pic 3 ca but you do not have any good approach to treat these patients, what are we looking for? So I think this is very important. Patients, again, are not machines. So they expect a lot if you do something. For example, in triple negative breast cancer. So you go for an NGS. It's very unlikely to fight something, sometimes the P53 for nothing. So I think that, again, if no clinical trials or no drugs available, just be sure that what are we looking for? 
Yeah, I agree. And it is an area of rich with research. So that's, that's one, one reason to do it. And I, I, I agree with everything you said, absolutely. Our last question, we just have like one or two minutes left. So patients who, and this is for Javier first, um, their disease has progressed on TDXD. And they haven't yet had a TKI, they haven't yet had TDM1, it was used in the second line setting. What is your preferred regimen now? We don't have comparative data between TDM1 and the HER2 climb regimen. So what do you do in that setting? So I like both. <laughs> I think that I will use both, but just after TDSD, so it depends, patient by patient again, so I have to consider different aspects but usually, based on the down regulation of HER2, which I think is transient, I like to give some chemo. So I, maybe I would go for 2K, trust to CAPE, and TDM1 afterwards. But if you take a biopsy and it continues to be HER2 positive, clearly, I would feel comfortable with either of them. Okay, and Paolo, you agree? Totally agree. I always prefer a chemo-based approach, but then it depends also on the preference of the patient because they're so different schedules, every three-week injective and many pills, so I think you have to discuss the options with the patient as well. Absolutely. I, I want to thank both of you. This was an outstanding program, very strong start to San Antonio. I want to uh, thank you all for your participation and our viewers at home and for the submission of questions. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful meeting. Thank you, everyone. This activity is certified by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. This activity is developed with our educational partners, GRASP and Living Beyond Breast Cancer. Remember to download the slides and practice aids.